my goal this morning, maybe I should call it a dream, maybe I should call it a hope, but I just want to communicate it nonetheless, is that you would leave our time a little bit more compelled by the audacity and the authenticity of the Easter story. That's, that's my dream this morning. Ah, my goal is not for you to be moved. My goal is not so much for you to be inspired. My goal is not for you to be humored. My goal is not necessarily for you all to be entertained. My goal is for you to leave a little bit more convinced that the outrageous claim that Jesus rose from the dead is actually the most reasonable explanation for what happened on that first Easter morning. I want you to leave this place just a little bit more convinced that the most significant story in human history, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, is actually true. As a dad, for my kids, I am not entirely interested that they would live the rest of their lives with Easter being this sentimental tradition that they celebrate year after year. My dream is that Easter would be a firm foundation on which they build their lives. The foundation that when they get to college and they go through the heat and they experience all of the criticism and the shots, they would be convinced that their faith is built on something sure. And that is my hope for every single person in this church. So if you have a copy of the Bible, let's go to John chapter 20, and we're going to start looking at verse number one. John chapter 20, starting at verse one. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, the verses will appear uh, up here on the screen, and you can follow along that way as well. John chapter 20, starting at verse 1. All right, here's what it says. Early on the first day of the week, that is Easter Sunday, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Um, so this particular retelling of the accounts of Easter morning begin with Mary Magdalene. Um, so she's making a beeline to the tomb where Jesus was buried about 36 hours before this. And her goal, her hope is to anoint or adorn his body, to embalm Jesus and give him the kind of burial she believed he deserved after watching him be so carelessly treated and so recklessly buried not too long before that. Um, so before the sun even peaks over the horizon, she begins her journey to the tomb. But when she gets there, her plans fall completely apart. She immediately notices the door is open. This massive boulder that was used to cover the entrance to the tomb where Jesus was buried had been moved. Which is a great time, by the way, for us to do just a little recap of the events leading up to this point. So um, after Jesus was murdered on a cross on Friday night, a very wealthy man by the name of Joseph went to the Roman powers that be, the Romans, the ones who ruled the world at the time, the ones who signed off and authorized Jesus' death. He went to them and he asked them for special permission to take the body of Jesus down and bury it. The Romans signed off, said, fine with us. So he he took the body down from the cross and he wrapped Jesus' body in a linen cloth. And then in full view of thousands of people, he carried this thing. In full view of the onlooking authorities, he carried the body of Jesus Christ and he put it in a tomb. And a tomb the Bible describes as a cave that he had carved out of a massive rock walks into this little room and he places the body of Jesus on a slab. And then he walks out of this room and then with the help, I'm assuming, of a number of people, 
they roll this massive stone down a little hill and into a groove at the entrance to the tomb, sealing it shut to keep the odor in and to keep the would-be grave robbers out. But it goes a little deeper than that. Uh, the, the Jewish religious authorities who hated Jesus because his influence had gotten a little bit too much and his threat had become a little bit too great for them, those guys who went after Jesus to kill him, you would think Jesus is now buried behind this massive boulder. They would be celebrating and throwing a party, but no, they go into panic mode. And so they make a beeline. They go to the Roman authorities and they make a special request. Um, and here's how the request goes. We remember that when Jesus was alive, he would say things like, one day I'm going to die. But don't worry, after three days I'm going to rise from the dead. And so they told the Roman authorities, listen, if this dude was that massive a problem when he was alive, can you imagine what would happen? If his disciples were somehow able to break into the tomb, steal the body of Jesus, and start to spread a rumor that Jesus is alive, that would become an intercontinental, unstoppable movement. That is an insurmountable problem for your Rome, and that is an insurmountable problem for us. Something must be done. The Roman authorities completely agree. So they station a highly trained soldier to guard the tomb around the clock. But that's not enough. They manage to get the Roman seal, the emperor's seal, and they place the seal on the tomb. Ooh, the most terrifying symbol in the entire world. The seal means if anyone even tampers with this tomb, they will meet the same fate that Jesus met. You will die. So then here comes Mary, and she gets to the tomb, and the first thing she notices is this massive boulder with the Roman seal on it has been moved. She doesn't investigate too much because she understands exactly what's happened. The Roman authorities have opened the tomb and they've taken the body of Jesus, and I have no idea where they put it because who else would have the audacity to defy the Roman Empire. And who else would have the audacity to overpower a trained Roman soldier? The only reasonable explanation is that the Empire of Rome came and they took the body of Jesus and they did something with it. And so she does a U-turn and she runs to the Airbnb where Jesus' disciples are hiding in fear from the, 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 the religious leaders. And she tells them the story that they have taken the body of Jesus and I have no idea what they have done with it. Peter and John, two of Jesus' disciples, hear this story, and a foot race commences towards the tomb, right? This is verse number Number two, here's what it says. So she came to Simon and Peter, and to the other, Simon Peter, and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. That's John, by the way, just speaking of himself in third person, which he liked to do whenever he humble bragged, and he's about to humble brag here in a little bit. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, she said, and we don't know where they have put him. Verse three. So Peter and the other disciple, John speaking of himself, started for the tomb. <laughs> Here it goes. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. <laughs> I'm not saying who won, but it wasn't Peter. Uh, when John gets there, um, he goes a little bit further than Mary did. Verse 5, he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go inside. He has seen enough to confirm the story that Mary had reported to him, that Jesus' body is gone and the Romans have taken him. All that's left are these cloths that he was wrapped in. And before... Um, John can even say anything. Here comes the Olympic silver medalist, Peter, also known to John as 
you know, <laughs> verse 6. Then Simon Peter came along behind him, might I add, and went straight into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. So Peter gets there, and Peter does what Peter does. He doesn't ask any questions. He doesn't ask any permission. He doesn't look around to see. Uh, he doesn't wait in the boat. He just jumps full send into the tomb, just runs into this little room. And he finds exactly what Mary had reported. Jesus, burial clothes, unoccupied by Jesus' body. The Romans took him because who else would dare Verse 8, finally, the other disciple <laughs> who had reached the tomb first, not that anyone's keeping track, <laughs> love this, he also went inside, he saw and he believed, parentheses. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Verse 10, then the disciples went back to where they were staying. John gets into the cave, inspired a little bit by Peter's courage, looks around and he immediately believes. He immediately believes. Believes what though? He believes what Mary had told them about an hour ago. That Jesus is gone and the Roman authorities have taken his body. And with that, the two of them went back to the Airbnb. Which pre pre presents an incredible time for us to take a really quick commercial break. And to ask the single most important question you will ever answer in your life. What do you believe happened to the body of Jesus? The single most important question you will ever answer in your life. What do you believe happened to the body of Jesus, how you most honestly answer this question will have bearing on how and where you spend forever and ever and ever. What do you believe happened to the body of Jesus Christ? How you most honestly answer this question will have bearing on how you journey through the deepest and darkest seasons of your life. What do you believe happened to the body of Jesus? And really, there are two logical options in this story. Was it Rome? Or is he risen? Was it Rome? Or is he risen? Did Rome take his body? Or did Jesus... Get on up. I'm not asking you what you think the correct answer the church would want to hear on a quiz is. I'm asking what do you really believe happened to his body. I'm not asking you what your parents have told you for years and years and years and years. I'm asking you what do you really believe that in the heat and under pressure you would answer this question honestly. I'm not asking you to say what the answer is. I'm asking you, what do you truly believe happened to the body of Jesus? And I promise you, how you answer this question determines this life and the next for you. 
But man, it's not lunch. But let me mess with y'all a little bit. Just, just what you believe about the Bible has no bearing on where you spend eternity. None. I'll go a step further. Believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross has no bearing on where you spend eternity. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of people in Jerusalem for Passover who watched Jesus die on a cross. Don't do it, Kondo. Yes, do it. Don't do it. Yes, do it. I'll do it. Okay. Um, Believing that Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins is not enough. Mm. Because if Rome took his body, Jesus is still dead and so are you. Anyone can say they died for your sins. But if the grave won and Rome took his body and that's how you answer the question, that is not enough. I am not exaggerating when I say this is the most important question you will ever answer. What happened to the body of Jesus? Don't take my word for it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. This is Paul speaking. And Paul says, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. The question is what happened to the body of Jesus? Is he risen or was it Rome? And I'm begging you, please do not get overly churchy and over familiar with all of your experience in and around the church. Because I'm reading a story of the two dudes who spent the most time in the physical presence of Jesus. And they walked into an empty tomb and they saw his cloths and they walked out and decided Rome took him. If it was that easy for them to be wrong, let's not be presumptuous about what we really believe in the heat of mourning, in the heat of pressure, in the heat of battle. What do we really believe happened to the body of Jesus? The most important question, the most important answer that you can Give. And I've read this story many times, but I'd never read this story with a sense of the tragedy and the terror of this moment. And again, it's not yet lunch, but let me mess with your theology just a little bit. Because if Peter and John got hit by a fish truck on their way back to the Airbnb and they didn't make it, they would be eternally doomed. But we walk with Jesus. Doesn't matter. Your belief, Rome took his body and Jesus is still dead? Ooh, you cannot bet on Rome and bank on heaven at the same time. Rome risen. And just to be clear, by the way, Rome represents anything other than Jesus rose from the dead. Because some of you are like, Rome, I don't think it was Rome. Well, what do you think? I think it's whatever. Oh, whatever equals Rome. That's not an answer. Well, some of you may say, well, I guess I've never really thought about it. If you've never really thought about it, that's Rome. And some of you might be like, yeah, no, I mean, I'm open. I think it's possible. Possible is not an option. That's it's like being married. Are you married? <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> no, the resurrection of Jesus is not a percentage thing. He's either risen or someone else took him because he's not in the grave. 
or there's some other explanation. And I'm just asking for you, which one, which one is it? And for anyone keeping score at home, it wasn't Rome. <laughs> uh, in fact, Rome is not even a rational response. I didn't come to church today to speak to your hearts and your feelings. I actually came to speak to your mind and your reason. And I'm telling you, Rome is not even a reasonable response. The Romans killed Jesus. Why? Because his influence was becoming a little too much of a threat. The Romans put a soldier and a seal at the tomb of Jesus. Why? Because they couldn't even risk the slightest possibility that even the smallest rumor would start to murmur about Jesus getting up from the grave. There would be no stopping a movement like that. We cannot have that happen. Which raises the question, why on earth? What did the Roman Empire shoot itself in the pinky toe by taking the body of Jesus out of the tomb and creating their own worst nightmare? But even more than that, the Romans were awesome at killing people. They were brilliant at it. They were brilliant, intelligent, war-winning strategists. They were brilliant. And I'm saying... If it was the Romans and for some dumb, dumb reason, they actually took the body of Jesus out of the grave, I would think at a bare minimum for the love of every mother in the room, they would close the door. <laughs> at least close the door. And if not, at least pick up after yourselves. You at least want to get those cloths out of there so it doesn't look like a Casper the Ghost situation. Rome taking the body of Jesus makes no sense. That would be the most counterproductive thing on the planet. But let's go even a step further than that. Less than two months after this, Peter would get up and he would preach the gospel of a resurrected Jesus to thousands of people who had seen him die. And on that day, it says 3,000 people believed that the dead Jesus was now the risen Jesus, and they came to faith in him. 3,000 people. When the Romans caught wind that Peter was preaching a resurrected Jesus, a risen Jesus, do you know what they did? Stop it, Peter. Stop saying that. Stop it, or we'll put you in jail. I'm like, that's so weird, because if y'all took his body, there is a very easy way for you to shut down this whole movement. Produce the body. Bring the body, and this whole thing stops, but the Romans couldn't produce the body because the Romans didn't have the body. Jesus is risen, y'all. It makes no sense for it to be the Romans. None whatsoever. No, nope. Jesus, rationally speaking, Rome doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I'm just telling you, my rational mind sees this and it says, yeah. I've never seen anyone just rise from the dead. But I can't think of a better explanation. How somebody who was dead and under supervision, guarded by the most powerful empire on the planet, mysteriously disappears after saying, I'm going to rise from the dead. To which John would say, I'm not even done. So, while the dudes went back to the spot, Mary stayed mourning the finality of Jesus being gone. Because what you believe about Jesus and that empty tomb will show up in the way you mourn in your darkest seasons of 
life. Verse 11, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She wanted to turn. The boys had seen. She wanted to see too. And she looked in there, and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord. The Romans have taken him, she said. And I don't know where they have put him. Okay, a few seconds ago, you're saying, oh, this is the most rational thing. But now we have angels just sitting there. It doesn't sound very rational. Fair point. But in this particular version of the story, I don't believe Mary knew that these were angels. I think as far as she was concerned, though, just two harmless looking Sneaky tourists who were checking out the tomb. The Romans took him. The Romans took him as she weeps with the finality of the end of this era. But come on, hold on to something. Verse number 14. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there in case you were wondering where he was. <laughs> Just in case. The jury was still out for you. He's risen. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. And a man just like us, we so often miss Jesus when we are convinced that our version of the story is right. Because it couldn't be Jesus because Rome took it. He can't be, because the church hurt me. Or it, it really couldn't be that, because he's just here to take away all the stuff that I enjoy. So obviously he can't be. I wonder what might be keeping you from recognizing Jesus even this morning. Verse 15, Jesus asked her, woman, why are you crying? What is it? that you were looking for. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him myself. She thought Jesus was the janitor, so Jesus catches a face full of attitude from Mary. Listen, man, here's the thing. If you took him, just tell me. I won't slap you. I won't sue. Just tell me where you put him. I'll go get him myself. Because what you believe about Jesus will determine what you do in your most painful seasons. And for many of us, we are bargaining with Jesus. Come on, man. I don't know who you are or why you're here or why you're trying to mess with my life. But listen, I'm just trying to. And we're bargaining with Jesus for so much less than he is there to give us. She is literally begging Jesus for his dead body to be put back in the tomb. That's the best case scenario for her. Put his dead body back so I can adorn it. Right? If for some of us bring my, Lord, bring my ex-girlfriend back, put it in my relationship where it was, right? Because we believe that th this option is so much better than the best that he often has for us. This is so fascinating, but Jesus is so good. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him, and she cried out in Aramaic. Rabboni! Just like that. <laughs> Which means, teacher. Woo this is a moment right here. She turns around. She's like, wait, what? Jesus! It's you? It's you, Jesus! Just like that, like squeaky voice, just like that. Jesus! It's you, but I, but they put, the, I thought, it can't, it's you! 
And I imagine Mary's like, um, can I change my answer? Is it too late to change? I'm going with risen. I want to go with risen now. Is it too late to change my answer? Because I said Rome before, but it's you. I'm going with risen. Is it too late to change my answer? I love this scene when she realizes for the very first time and her faith is completely changed from team Rome to team risen. She freaks out. In the presence of Jesus. Come on. How many of you know Jesus is so good. He will give you a million reasons and a million chances to change your answer to risen. And Easter Sunday is one of those reasons for you. Whether it's the first time you've declared risen or it's the 500th time you're redeclaring. Jesus, I believe in a way that will stand in the middle of the heat. You are risen. Verse 17, Jesus said, do not hold on to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. He says, go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. I love this for so many reasons. One of them being, Mary, you started this false narrative that Rome took my body. I want you to go and fix it. Tell them I'm alive. (laughs) I love that. And if we had time to talk about the insanity of this, that just helps my reason for believing in the resurrected Savior. Because if you were making up a story about being alive from the dead, you would never in the first century context like this Give that responsibility to a woman whose testimony wasn't even valid in court. Jesus is like, I don't care. A, about your ridiculous convention. But B, it's true. And he gives this message to Mary and Mary carries it back to the rest of the disciples. Verse 18, when Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I I have seen the Lord, she said. And she told them that he had said these things to her. They didn't seem quite convinced. Uh, They were clearly more afraid of the Jewish leadership who had killed Jesus. And they were awed by the news that Jesus might have risen. Verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, Easter Sunday, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And I believe it was in this moment that every single one of them became willing to die for the message that Jesus is risen. How cool is this? By the way, that in the midst of their great fear, Jesus comes into the room and he declares peace, which is powerful, by the way. Because if Jesus is risen, it means he can defeat the thing we fear most. He can overcome death. And if the one who can overcome death is with you and he says, peace, everything is going to be all right. And just like with Mary, I love that he doesn't come to them with one hand on his hip and the other one in their face condemning them for believing Rome took his body. No, 
Jesus comes to them with scars in his hands to convince them he has risen from the dead. I love that. When Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't have to keep those scars. He could have cleaned those right up. But he wanted his people convinced enough to die for the message that he had risen from the dead. He kept him some scars. And he showed them because he wanted them to be convinced. Oh, don't worry. No, these don't hurt me anymore. These are designed to help you. Believe. I got on up. I wonder if Jesus isn't here today to convince or reconvince you that he is risen. And if you believe that, by faith, come on, what we have believed as a church is not some fairy tale where we cross our fingers and we close our eyes and we just hope we're right about Jesus. What we believe about Jesus is time, space, history. The same way I believe in the forefathers of this country who I've never met. I believe the story of Jesus rising from the dead. And if you believe and declare that Jesus has risen from the dead, that will change everything in this life and in the next. Because if he is able to get up from the grave, then when you die, he's going to get you up too. If he's able to get up from the grave, then he has the power to cancel every single sin you've ever committed because he can. If he's risen from the grave, then when you walk through the darkest, deathly seasons of your life, none of them intimidate the power of the one who conquered death. I'm asking you, what's your answer to the most significant question in human history? What happened to the body of Jesus? And if you believe he's risen, check this out. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13. Let's read this again. Look at this. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise Christ from the dead if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep, who've died as followers of Jesus Christ, they're lost. If only for this life we have put our hope in Christ, we of all people are most to be pitied. And I say amen to that. If we're living radically and all we have is this life, we are to be pitied. Come on, verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He's risen. He's alive. And it changes everything. My faith is not futile. My faith is full and rich. And if you declare Jesus is risen from the dead in faith, so is yours. I don't know where you stand on this, but for some of you, this may be the first time you are making the declaration and what a declaration to make. For some of you, it's maybe the first time that you are pulling away from the traditions of the church and the things your family has said, and you are making the declaration for yourself. Jesus, you have risen, and that makes all the difference in the world. 